the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. All right, let's get started. Um, so welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today are two very special guests. We've got Max Sills, who is IP counsel at Square and also general manager at COPA. Uh, we also have Jed Grant, and Jed is CEO and founder of KYC3 and also co-founder of OCA, uh, Open Crypto Alliance, uh, where I'm also a board member. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi. Thanks for having us. Thank of course. You. So, Max, how did you get into this space? Could you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, so I've always been interested in crypto. Um, my interest started in law school. Uh, I was interning at the Securities Exchange Commission in the, in the Risk Fin division then. And um, I was just getting so excited about new financial products. And I really believed in the SEC's mission. They really did want to. We worked on the crowdfunding regulations there. We really wanted to um, democratize finance while also protecting people from crazy investments. Um, so before my, my current role, I was working at Google and I came when I was when I started at Google, I had a very much a very legalistic, very transactional mindset about business, about everything. Um, but I started working in, in the open source group on open source licensing and open source legal policy. And over the six or seven years I was there, my entire world changed. My whole my whole worldview changed. My philosophy changed. Um, I think I went from being very there's there's like a legal mindset, you know, for for a baby lawyer, um, very adversarial, to be to realizing like how important sharing was. Um, and it was just amazing to me learning more about the open source community and open source developers. Just first, how much people pour their heart and souls into public projects with little or no expectation of, of payment, um, but also how much money and how much progress can be made through open sharing. And yeah, so it just changed my whole philosophy. And I was running uh, our open source licensing and, and, and policy uh, for a while. And the Square opportunity was really interesting because um, it helped me get back to my roots uh, in, in finance. But where open source was really interesting because it was about collaborative development on um, software. Crypto is even a step further. It's collaborative participation in networks. And the legal issues there are so weird. And the technology I, I deeply believe is so important for society. So yeah, it was just when, when the opportunity to, to join Square and also um, help COPA get off the ground came along, I had to take it. Awesome. So Jed, how about you? How did you get in this space? I've been um, a cypherpunk for as long as I can remember. I, that, that Open Crypto X Apple II text is uh, where I spent my childhood. And I, um, I've always been interested in cryptography and, and uh, privacy and how computer networks work together. In the 90s, I ended up as a civilian lieutenant colonel doing running an IT section at NATO. Uh, so I was kind of, you know, a suit and tie crypto guy in the daytime, um, cryptography, I mean, and then the cypherpunk by night. And when Bitcoin came around, I was obviously totally interested in it. And I didn't really think it would succeed the way it has. So I did pass up on a lot of Bitcoin when they were very cheap. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but still been in the space long enough to to enjoy it. And I think it's um, looking back, um, the profound impact of the white paper at the time was not clear to me. But I really believe that, that this is an invention that is going to go down in history like the Wright brothers. And this is a technology that is going to change humanity. And that's that's why we're here today. That's what's so important about it. 100 percent. Awesome. All right, so let's get into companies. Uh, Max, I'd like to start with you. Could you talk a little bit about uh, Square Crypto and also COPA and how it, how it was essentially founded and what it's meant to do? Sure. Um, so Square's fundamental mission is uh, 
open access to financial products for everyone. And, and, and COPA really is an, was founded as an extension of that. It, it was started by Square, but it's an independent entity and we now have diverse board members and diverse members. Um, COPA is pretty simple. We, we, like Jed was saying, we believe uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, are world changing, history changing technologies. And we want everyone to have access to them. And it's just the start of development. And this is where um, things like patents or fear of litigation is really spooking some people and is chilling uh, development. And so COPA's mission is really simple and really obvious. Fight that stuff, fight anything, defend anything, uh, defend against anything that will chill development, specifically related to uh, IP litigation. Awesome. It's a very good, uh, very good and noble cause. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So Jed, uh, could you explain Open Crypto uh, Alliance or OCA? Sure, sure. OCA is, um, well, actually before pre-OCA, um, I've been in the space. I've been developing technology. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been independent since the early 2000s and always building products, building code um, to achieve something and building on the giants of, on the shoulders of giants who came before me. And that's what open source allows us to do. Um, so before OCA, I, I could tell that this was going to heat up. I mean, I saw the browser wars. I saw the mobile patent wars. So I've seen all these tech patent wars and it's a cycle. You get a new technology and about six to 10 years in from that new technology, you have patent wars where all the giants fight it out. And I knew that was coming for, for blockchain and crypto. And so I started uh, ringing the bell, you know, in, in 2018 and 17 and 18 and published a couple articles then about the, the potential problem, started to get some network of people who, who that resonated with. And then, uh, and I actually also, I filed a patent in 2017. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily condone people and encourage people to do that, but I filed a patent as a defensive measure and joined Lot Network, which is another organization not represented here today, but, but Lot Network is licensed on transfer. It's doing a different mission aligned with what we're doing. Um, and, and the idea there was simply to prevent uh, patent trolls and pat abusive patent holders from attacking my entrepreneurial activity. Um, so I've been looking at patents in blockchain and crypto now for a couple of years. And um, the process of this patent going through and then looking at how, how it could be opposed and whatnot gave me this idea that there are a lot of people filing abusive patents today that are based on existing technology mm -hmm. that they're not necessarily the inventor of. Uh, that they're they're trawling through GitHub and finding ideas and then patenting them, and mm -hmm. and we can actually oppose this before the patent is granted, which is much more cost effective, uh, because during that process the patent office is is more likely to side with you, and it's cheaper to to make that argument. Once the patent is granted, the the patent office has to admit they made a mistake if you get it overruled, and and it's much harder to get someone to admit they made a mistake. So this strategy dawned on me, and then I looked at how many patents were being filed, and we have, you know, um, a couple hundred in, in 2017, a uh, couple thousand in 2018, I think it's 1,500, and 2019, boom, 10,000 patents, 2020, 13,000 patents filed in the space. To me, this patent war is coming really quickly, and the time that we're going to be able to oppose them is now. We need, to, we need to get on the ball now. This is not a battle we can wait to fight. So, so that's when I said, look, we got to make, we got to do something about this. And I pulled together a couple of people I knew and uh, we decided to, to create Open Crypto Alliance with the goal of actively preventing patents from being granted in the space on technologies that shouldn't be patented in the first place. Awesome. Also a great, uh, great noble cause. Um, I think that when patents are introduced i mean of course you want to protect your ideas but it can also be used in a very harmful way so yeah uh, yeah it's it's funny the system is supposed to be good i mean it had a noble origin mm -hmm. um, if you secure for inventors a limited monopoly in their idea like then they can um this will encourage innovation and for really expensive stuff like drugs or or, or chips 
this is this is a built-in way for people to recoup their costs. Mm -hmm. So th the patent system has its heart in the right place, or at least it, it did. But as Jed was saying, um, things have gotten really tilted because now people are securing or attempting to secure monopolies. And they did no innovation. They're actually mm -hmm. chasing down the people that are doing innovation. And right. these people that are really working, developing, they don't have a lot of money. And also they don't understand the legal nuances of the patent system. So mm -hmm. any, any kind of threat, even if it doesn't have merit, is enough to scare them. And so this, this was never anticipated, but it's, it's kind of the consequences of the, uh, the current patent system. That makes sense. It's uh, yeah, it's it's and the cost implication is huge. I mean, as an entrepreneur, um, and I, I fully expected this to happen sooner than it is happening. Um, when when we saw the ICO boom, I, I saw a lot of companies with no product and a white paper that explained their entire strategy out there sitting on 10 to 20 million bucks. I expected those guys to get shaken down. I'm really surprised. It's just because the patents hadn't been granted yet. Uh, mm -hmm. is why it didn't happen, because that was the perfect target for a patent troll. You know, a company with no product, a white paper that says what they're going to do, and lots of money. It's a it's a patent lawsuit dream. And that's when I really thought it was going to happen. I think it's going to happen soon, though, in, in this second uh, bull market that we're seeing now. And the cost of this, people don't really think about it. They think, first of all, it's not going to happen to me, uh, but you never know. If you're mm -hmm. innovating, it can happen to you. And the cost of it, I mean, if you get trolled, you're going to end up spending a quarter million bucks. Whether you win or not, you're going to spend at least a quarter million bucks. That's a best case scenario. And, mm -hmm. and you could end up actually closing your business. They'll shut you down if it's a competitor. If it's a troll, they could end up taking a part of your business and a permanent license fee on your business in the future. So this is a very expensive process. And it would cost an, an order of magnitude less is what we're proposing to prevent these patents from being granted in the first place. It's a vicious cycle too, Jed. I mean, because yep. even if you don't litigate and you just settle, then you're funding the trolls. And so they have more capital to go after more people and they get worse and worse. And you give them a case of precedence mm -hmm. where they can then use to, to boost the, the strength of that patent that they're gonna use against others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is totally a vicious cycle. And one of the things that, that you were saying, Max, is patents, yeah, they have their utility, particularly on what you cited, which is physical products. We're talking about intellectual property here. And I actually don't believe that patents on software are a mix. I mean, it's like putting yeah. gasoline in a martini. It just doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's a tough conversation because, you know, patents aren't supposed to protect abstract ideas. But at least in the U.S., the case law is really messy and there's been this opening to allow people yeah. to try to protect yeah. So what can member uh, member companies and uh, members of, of either alliance uh, hope to achieve? Like what, why would somebody join uh, COPA and why would somebody join OCA? So I'll speak for COPA. Um, so we have a couple of things going that should be enticing to, to new members. The first is we're a classic um, patent license and patent pool. So if you join COPA, you get a license from all the current members, including Square, MicroStrategy, Crack and Coinbase um, that we won't no none of the current members will bring suit against you ever for cryptocurrency related patents. There's also a patent pool element. So if you get hit by a practicing entity, we have this ability that you can borrow a patent from one of the other members to help to help defend yourself. Um, so that's important. Like a lot like Jed was mentioning or Oliant, we're trying to build a community around people going, we think we can make more money and the world can be a better place if we focus on making really good products instead of focusing on beating each other up so early. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we're doing, and we also encourage uh, members is we want to participate in defending small, defending um, core developers for um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies against meritless lawsuits. And so if you join and, and if you donate, we're putting that money directly to take the fight to, um, people who are scared, like I said earlier, scaring and chilling, chilling development. And we're doing the same. Uh, we are totally complimentary. So actually, I would encourage any entrepreneur uh, to join COPA, to join OCA, 
and to join Lot Network because the three organizations are totally complementary, each one with a different mission and an important mission in the space. So what we're doing is we're looking at those patents that are in the process of being granted um, that we consider to be abusive uh, and unmerited patents. And we're going to go after those and try to, to get them invalidated before they're granted or after they're granted if we have to. Um, so, and obviously we know who our donors are, we'll take their, their business into account and we can prioritize uh, how we go about spending our resources based on, on what interests we want to protect. Uh, but our, our fundamental goal is to keep the technology behind Bitcoin and blockchain open and free for all to build on. Awesome. Um, so I understand there's some defensive work going uh, like underway right now. Can you talk about that? Or how would you, I guess, if you can't talk about that, how would you describe how a uh, defensive uh, patent prevention suit might happen? Yeah, um, I would start with a message to any developers that are that are listening or anyone that has been the recipient of a threat. Don't settle. Contact me. Contact COPA. You can find our website at opencrypto.org. We have strength in numbers. Um, so basically what we're doing right now is we're collecting examples of, of core developers and companies that are undercapitalized or only, only kind of middle capitalized. And they're receiving, we're, we're, we're trying to classify the kinds of threats that the industry is receiving, patents, other IP claims and, 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 and others. And we're prioritizing it and trying to find like where can we get the best the best return on investment in terms of uh, defending so we'll have more information on that publicly available shortly great that's interesting we should talk about that i actually have a case that patent i filed i received an opposition on it uh, you did yeah <laughs> signing so from a finnish law firm uh that doesn't disclose who their clients are but they cite a patent that's from a company called nchain it was filed about two weeks before I filed the patent that I filed in 2017. Mm. Uh, the patent's not relevant to, to what I filed, but anyways, that's a different point. That's interesting. Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, so. If members were, uh, you know, say they've, they've, um, they've been hit with a lawsuit, uh, what can they expect? What's, what's the process like? Uh, what kind of protection is available? I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you what that process is going to be like from a lawyer standpoint. From an entrepreneur standpoint, they're going to have their life turned upside down. They're going to not be able to focus on building their business. Mm -hmm. You're going to be focused on dealing with lawyers all day long. You're going to be expending resources that you had planned to put into R&D, into legal defense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just going to wreck your business. It is a complete waste of time. It is hindering innovation on a massive scale. So this is the kind of thing you want to avoid. Uh, at all costs as an entrepreneur. You do not want to put yourself in that position, which is why um, th there is, you know, unfortunately we have this system of patents and it is somewhat broken and, and doesn't really do what we want it to do. Um, software patents are, are very controversial. So you do have to understand you're in that environment and it may make sense for you to actually proactively patent. And then of course, join COPA, LotNet, OCA. These are your defense. and you can't buy fire insurance when your house is burning down. You need to do it beforehand. You need to get involved now. And then when you do get that patent suit, when you do encounter that problem, you have those defenses at your disposal. I, you know, you're so right, Jed. And I'm just thinking how tragic it is for small companies that should be focusing on their business. They get hit with a lawsuit, they're panicked. Their money that was supposed to go towards R and D or hiring is now. Um, it's it's a terrible situation. One piece of advice I'd give to people is so there's there's a progress in a lawsuit. So mm -hmm. before someone actually sues you, you're going to get either a, what's called the demand letter, where they're going to probably ask you to stop doing certain things or start talking to them. Um, I guess my advice is. First, that's not the that's not an actual lawsuit. People send and receive demand letters all the time. It can be really scary, as, especially as Jed was saying, for a small business. Don't act impulsively. If you receive a demand letter, it's incredibly important to take a breath, take a step back, see if other people have received um, similar letters. There was some. I, I, 
the unfortunate thing is sometimes people receive demand letters and they don't have a lot of experience and they're really scary. I mean, I don't know if you've ever received one, but it's really scary to think that like your whole life could get turned upside down through litigation. And it's unfortunate for the whole industry when people uh, just do what they're being requested without taking a moment to realize what their defenses are. That's really good insight because I think, yeah, you do see, you know, you've got the like, letterhead and it sounds really official. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like a classic scam where somebody's, you know, using that position of authority to say, oh, you must do this. And people are like, well, I, I guess I probably should because it seems official. But it's really yeah. interesting that you're saying, you know, stop and question that and don't act rational or act irrationally. It's good. We're in the Bitcoin space, man. Question authority. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And a, a very, very smart lawyer told me, um, qui s'excuse s'accuse in French. He's a Luxembourgish lawyer. If if you say you're sorry, you're admitting you're guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, you you stand up when someone comes towards you like that with that, and the demand letter might be quite polite and seemingly friendly, but it's very a veiled threat. Mm -hmm. um, don't don't say you're sorry. Don't don't admit anything. Don't give them an inch. Just uh, push back. Go get legal counsel and push back hard. So I guess that's a, a good question. When uh, once that demand letter is served, what's uh, so? First of all, don't react uh, irrationally or impulsively. Uh, what's the next step that people should be doing, and what can members uh, in either organization uh, expect if they're in that situation? Yeah. So I have to. I don't. I can't be giving everyone um, legal advice, but I'll say. I, I, here's what I can say. It depends on the nature of the demand letter. Mm -hmm. If you're working in the cryptocurrency space. Um, and you receive a demand letter related to an allegation of patent infringement, that's something COPA definitely wants to know about. I'm sure OCA wants to know about. You mm -hmm. can contact us. Um, but generally, there's a lot of different claims flying around. The best piece of advice I can give to people is make friends and connect to the network of people who are situated similar, similarly to you. Mm -hmm because the chances are you're not the only one to receive it. And so obviously the, the best thing is if you have the funds, go get your own lawyer. But I've been watching and if 20 people got a suit, one or two of them got a lawyer. And if you're all talking with each other, then you can start coordinating a common defense. Mm -hmm. So I guess the best piece of advice is obviously go get your own attorney, but make friends now with other people in your space and keep that line of communication open and share with each other if you're receiving threats because there really is strength in numbers. Yeah, yeah. And we wanna prevent that from happening. I mean, if, if no trolls have patents, those letters don't go out. And that mm -hmm. is what OCA is, is about. And we do have um, a good reach. We've had an amazing, amazing response so far of both technical and legal experts coming forward saying, hey, I wanna volunteer my time. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a, a number of lawyers in, in Mexico, in, in South America, uh, in the UK and in other European countries who've come forward and said, I'm, I'm here and ready to support you. Um, and obviously, we're, we're happy to connect someone who'd be in that position with these lawyers who have a, you know, an, a predisposition to being friendly and, and helping uh, such an entrepreneur in, in distress who's trying to in, innovate in the crypto space. Uh, similarly, the tech experts have come forward and said, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I can help you find the prior art. And I have uh, about a dozen people who've come forward in, in this capacity as well. And that's part of our strategy at OCA is actually we want to, we need to crowdsource the patents. So we need to review, I mean, there's 20, 25,000 patents we need to canvas out there, applications that are pending. And we need to identify the ones that are abusive. And, and this is a huge gargantuan task. And then when we've boiled those down into normal guy, you know, geek speak, then we need to get the techies, the people like me who understand the tech to go and find the prior art. And I'm convinced that patent offices are not making a full use of GitHub and, and SourceForge and mm. these kind of repos where a lot of this prior art exists. And, and it's through the community uh, and reaching out to people who've worked on projects, you know, Lightning and other payment projects on crypto, where we're going to find the guys who go, yeah, you know, actually in, in 2013, I wrote some code that did this, you know, and, and then you've got your prior art. And that's so that's a lot of how we want. And we want to do that in a crowdsourced and 
very organized way so that we end up with a database that is a community resource that can be used by anybody. I mean, not just OCA members and donors, but we want to make that available. So if someone's getting attacked by a patent troll, they can use this database to defend themselves. But we Excellent. need funds to do that. We need resources. So that's... that's uh, so OCA, OCA is actively uh, looking for members, member companies, essentially. We are. What, what, you're, what you all are doing is super important. I also encourage, like you were saying, Jed, join COPA, join OCA. Um, we, yeah, I, I, it shouldn't be too hard for you guys to get support because you're doing something really important that's really Thanks. needed. Thanks, Max. Um, so one thing I'm curious about is how uh, these cooperative organizations can work together. So in this instance, how how would COPA and OCA be working together? That's a really good question. You know, um, OCA is really new. Uh, we, we just grouped together and started coalescing in uh, November of last year. We started to put the flag out and uh, Max reached out to us and, and said, hey, uh, you guys might be doing something interesting. And I was immediately very, very responsive and, and realized that we're on the same mission, totally complimentary, and uh, that we could could do a lot together. We had a couple conversations and so far things are looking looking really like we do see completely eye to eye. It is, it's pretty amazing. What do you think, Max? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. The cool, I mean, COPA is pretty new as well. But we have such a grand vision of just stopping nonsense lawsuits, stopping nonsense legal threats so that developers develop. Companies try to make money making cool products. Um, that's the economy we all want to see. That's, uh, but we have, we have such big plans. There's no possible way uh, COPA can do it by itself. And we're also trying to model for everyone, get together, make friends, develop a community. This is how you stay safe. So when I met Jed and learned about what OCA was doing, I thought, thank, thank God, because this is something totally off our plate now. Because OCA has really a developing expertise, um, particularly in Europe, South America, in validating patents, finding prior art. And that just goes so well with what COPA wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so we were affiliated. We're very happy to drive um, as much as I can membership to to OCA, um, but I, I guess it's an open call for anyone else or any other organizations trying to um, create safety and pred predictability in the cryptocurrency industry. We all have big ideas, but none of us can can do them all by ourselves. So mm -hmm. we definitely need to work together. The That's cyber awesome. hornets. <laughs> <laughs> A hundred percent. And like you mentioned, you know, the strength in numbers, that's a, a really old cypherpunk maxim. And it's a very applicable one because there is strength in numbers and people tend to forget that, you know, they're, they're so used to not questioning authority. I think in our space, uh, people are, so we're a little bit more immune to that, but. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's really interesting. Just like the litigation thing, like Jetta, as you were saying earlier, being mistrustful of authority, being, um, for massive distributedness, um, kind of, it's it's fascinating to watch that tension with when, when people are interacting with like the classic centralized legal systems and power structures. Kind of like watching those two things. There's a little bit of cognitive dissonance, at least for me. Totally, totally. We're in a, we're in a very strange space, and you know this pandemic has made it all the stranger, but it's also given us. A lot of time to reflect. I think a lot of people, we had to all slow down. And I think 2020 was a year where a lot of people who wouldn't have taken a vacation at all ended up having like four weeks of, of nothing but contemplating their existence. <laughs> and we're going to see the fruit of that. I think that ultimately is going to be beneficial. And, and people are beginning to understand that um, it, about questioning authority, it's really whose interests are you looking after? Uh, and you pose that question to any third party. And, and the answers you get back as a thinking individual are, are often quite eye-opening. So this, right. is, this is where we're headed. And when you look at a trustless, permissionless, decentralized system where the rules are the same for everybody and everything is clear and open, uh, it just is such a different future than, than totally. the dystopia that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. we, we What we like to do is, it, maybe it's a little like, starry-eyed, but the end point is a more open, more transparent financial system 
where regular people have more power to transact and more more privacy and freedom. And then just how do we work backwards from there? So that happened. That's a society that's already present. How, what did we do today to get there? Mm -hmm. And we won't achieve perfection, but in trying to get there, we're going to improve the condition of where we are. You know, I, I, I read uh, Enlightenment Now not very long ago, and, and it's a worthwhile read because it puts things in perspective. A lot of people say, oh, man, I wish we lived in the past. I'd be such a genius and with everything would be great. But actually, if I chose a moment to be born, it would be like right now. There's no better time to be born than today because we are we are advancing you know, human society every day and have been for the past several hundred years. So, you know, I, re I recently put a, uh, a little quote out on my Twitter about um, Rothschild where he said, give me the power to to control a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. That quote coincides with the end of the Renaissance. I don't know if that is, a, you know, there's any correlation, but it's a coincidence perhaps. But then, you know, Hal Finney running Bitcoin is the start of the next renaissance, in my opinion. Yeah. That's a really yeah. good way to put it. And it's a very nice tribute. Thanks. So I guess call to action. Um, if people are looking to, you know, connect with either group, uh, Max, let's start with you. Where can they find more about Square Crypto and Copa? And where can they connect with you online? Yeah. So um, we have two channels. You can, we have a Twitter, uh, Open Crypto Org, at Open Crypto Org. So you can just DM us where we, we want to talk to you. Um, and you can find Copa at opencrypto.org. You can find our current member list, um, a list of our recent posts, and also an email link to, uh, to contact us. But we're, we're really open. We want to, we obviously, we want new members. We think we're, we, we think we offer a valuable service that is going to help everyone. Um, but we also want to hear from people who are receiving threats or are scared because it's our job to try to help you. So let us know what's going on with you. Sorry, not I have to be specific. Not everyone receiving threats all over the internet. <laughs> cryptocurrency developers or cryptocurrency using companies that are receiving legal threats related to cryptocurrency. Let us know. Yes, not trolling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are opencryptoalliance.org, all one word, .org, and opencryptox on Twitter. Uh, get to know us. Pay attention and uh, then reach out anytime. We're very open as well. And I, I think the board members and shareholders of the, of the structure will be announced shortly. And uh, that most of the founders are, are pretty well known to the, to the three people in this call, I think. So. <laughs> so one of the ways I like to end the shows is to ask if you have uh, questions for our listeners or viewers. So Max, let's start with you. Do you have any particular questions for the Bitcoin community or people working on open source projects? Yeah. Um, so obviously the first question is what can COPA do to help? Let me know. Um, but I, you know, everyone's been watching the stock market go crazy and Bitcoin, Bitcoin's price rapidly accelerate. Um, what I'm really interested to know from your viewers and listeners is let's say Bitcoin just crashed and stayed crashed, um, to like, a penny tomorrow would you still be interested in it and why kind of going back to it's not just something that is fun to collect that can be converted to fiat but like let's go back to the the fundamental ideas of personal freedom and uh, transparency and i just i would love to know like how do your how do your how, how do you all feel now that's a good question it makes me think of the I'm in it for the tech meme of the guy with all the gold on. <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. I, I have a couple questions for the community. Um, when did you first read the Cypherpunk Manifesto? And if you haven't read it, are you going to read it? Because I think that's an important document from 1993 that really outlines a lot of what you need to understand to understand what crypto is about. So that's an important thing to think about. And um, why are you, sort of what Max was saying, but why are you here? What do you want crypto to do in this world, in, in your vision to make a better world? 
I mean, it, it's not about Lambos. That, that's that's uh, some altcoins might be about Lambos. But, you know, what can we do? If you look at Lightning Network, have you tried Lightning Network? Have you have you looked at how that works? Have you spun up a node? I mean, for less than 200 bucks, you can get all the hardware. You can even run it on your laptop. Um, but you can spin up a node and be your own bank. And and have you thought about what that can do for remittance? I think the remittance industry is going to be disrupted on a massive scale in the next 24 months. And what's that going to do to Africa and to South America and Central America and Asia? This is going to be amazing. And what are you doing to make this happen faster so that our world can move forward? Awesome. Yeah, I think there's some pretty amazing companies in the space. Strike comes to mind. Um, they're doing some pretty cool things. You know, I encourage people to to look at Lightning. Uh, it's quite amazing what it can do, the Lightning Network. And it's still, you know, it's been around, I think, six or seven years. And, you know, it's still a little experimental, but um, there's some pretty cool things happening. Uh, BTC you know, from, server as well is another yeah, From project. white paper till now. I, th I think it really got usable. And I mean, you could do the first Lightning payments in 2018. So it's, and mm -hmm. it's really now where it's beginning it's still but we're we're in early days and that's the other thing that blows my mind do you think you missed out on crypto do you think you missed bitcoin well, that yeah. it's like it's like we're in 15 you know 90 and you're saying yeah. i missed the printing business no you didn't it's starting <laughs> we're just in exactly. the beginning this is dial up days this is windsock you know we're at i think you know you used to have to dial up and connect with windsock to get online so you could use you know, uh, cello and opera and these old browsers that no one even uses or has even heard of to mm -hmm. look at some simple web pages with a picture of a cat. That was that was the Internet in the 90s. You know, <laughs> that was what it was. U.S. robotics. You know, that was like the stock. <laughs> it's gone. Mm -hmm. Well, and until an industry reaches maturity, like you don't necessarily know what applications are going to be available, possible and popular. Um, so you really need to have that new medium rich maturity. And then you can start seeing some of these things like who knew, you know, social media would have such a revolution and whether that's positive or negative, uh, just the fact that these companies didn't even exist, you know, into like what it's like the late nineties when they first started emerging and really they weren't disruptive until the early two thousands. So. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And where, where would, well, you yeah, know, where would society be if they got sued out of existence? Well, I'm, well, that's, so that's a real that's a <laughs> dicey yeah. question, you know. Very, yeah, it's spicy. Where would we be without surveillance capitalism? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I realize that as I said, but <laughs> crypto, it's like growing a garden, and our plant, we just have tiny, tiny little plants. We need to do whatever we can to, to, to let them grow. And it is the answer to surveillance capitalism. For Decentralized sure. finance is the answer Absolutely. to surveillance capitalism. It is. And and anything with social as well. I know that there's a number of new platforms that are are being developed um, that are, are quite interesting that are, you know, user focused. So user privacy focused. And some of those projects are very low key and don't get a lot of publicity. One that I've come across uh, that I like is Libri, L-B-R-Y. Mm -hmm. It's a decentralized YouTube publishing platform. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty interesting. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me. And um, keep fighting. Thanks. Strength in numbers. <laughs>